I'm so happy to have you uh, as a first guest of Transatlantic. I mean, uh, like, thanks, I, you know how much I admire you. Uh, you are like a great Same. person all around, a great creative mind. And uh, oh, thank you. I'd like to talk to you today to understand what it truly takes to make it in America and what kind of like advice and what kind of inspiration your story could be for young Italian creatives. I try well, to thank you so much. That's such a nice introduction, such a nice compliment. I really appreciate that. You're welcome, my man. Look, at yeah. Transatlantic, we believe that each of us is an ocean, an ocean of erratic thoughts, wild feelings, uncommon places, uncommon stories. And to really yeah. get to know someone, that you had to cross the ocean. So we are here yeah. today to cross your ocean. We're going to ask you <laughs> questions. And through these seven questions, we're going to try to understand your personality, your journey. I always yeah. say to people when they ask me what transatlantic questions look like, and I always say it's like a Proust questionnaire, but with a lot of water in it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, so let's give it a go. Here's the okay. first question. $30 was the price that an immigrant needed to pay to guarantee a spot in the steerage area of the, of the boats. Hmm. $30. Yeah. Now, those $30 were like an amount of money to build a future for yourself. My question for you is this. Was there a price that you had to pay to build your future and your career in advertising, in American advertising? Uh, for American advertising in particular, um, great question, first of all. And I think the thing I like about this question is, is it makes you reevaluate what currency means, right? Like I think $30 back then, and what did you have to do for that $30? I think that in... You know, when I first got into advertising, it was, uh, you know, early 90s. Hmm. And people were telling me, oh, advertising is too dangerous. It's too volatile. Whenever there's a recession, the first jobs lost are advertising jobs. You know, it's very risky. And I, I don't think, I, I think they were telling me the same thing that they told every other student in university. But I, I was an immigrant. And, and so before... You have to compare the, the price that I paid to advertising to the price that I paid to even get in America. Right. So the, the price that I had to pay to get into advertising was much less. You know, in order to get to America, the cost I paid was losing my grandmother and losing the love of my grandmother every day, losing the hugs and the, and the kisses and, and the confidence. You know, walking in the streets of, of Egypt where everyone looked like me and, and I felt so comfortable. You know, people would call me Prince in the street, you know? When I turned on the TV shows, all the heroes in, in the movies look like me or look like my uncle or look like my dad. All the, all the best musicians look like my family. You know what I mean? So it was such a place of comfort. And the price I had to come to America was discomfort. That was my price. And I had to get comfortable being uncomfortable to be American. I had to embrace the things that other people want to stop. When other people feel pain, they want to stop, right? For me, I had to learn to be comfortable in that, in that pain. I like There's that. that. I like yeah. that. It's, it's, it's a story that I can relate to. I read yeah. a while ago that how a brain is wired in a way that whenever you, you meet uncomfortable, there is this self mechanism of defense where your brain say no no stop hold on yeah but it's when you go through the barrier and yeah. you break the uncomfortable and become your comfortable that's when you actually can make like great things happen so great 100 i love that 100 100 percent so Second i think we, oh no, okay yeah go. oh so i was gonna say so the reason why i didn't get deterred when people told me advertising is competitive, advertising is dangerous, is because I was already comfortable with being uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I know that you love boxing too. I, I had a really, really cool experience with a boxing coach. When we got to the end of our workout, we started doing abs, right? 
And when we were doing abs, he said, this is where you practice your game face. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, psychologically, when you're fighting someone, don't show pain. Don't show discomfort. If someone's hitting me in the face, hitting me in the body, and you don't show pain, it makes the other guy lose confidence. Yeah. Goes, so when you're doing your abs, I see pain in your face. This is where you practice not showing pain. So whenever we did abs, he'd make me smile. I knew it as <laughs> it's a mental game. It's a mental, mental game. game. Yeah, totally that's, mental game. That's what not I just say in boxing, but in life. That's what I say to young creative in Italy, like you know, that wanted to come like in America and like trying to trying to bet like on their career and start like something in America. I say it's a mental game. You yeah. have to believe in yourself so strongly that you have to dive into that kind of like mental power. 100%. And what is, you know, you took a picture recently in, in front of one of my favorite poets. Both of us actually love Bukowski very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, he lives, and what he is, lives, I say lives because for me, he's still alive. But yeah, yeah. Uh, his graveyard is like nine miles from my house. Yeah. Yeah. And what does his tombstone say? Don't try. <laughs> yes. Don't try. You don't try. In America, you don't try. You either do it or you don't do it. I like don't it. try. I like. And I like, I like that. I think there's lots of different ways to interpret don't try, just like Nike's just do it. Yeah. But I think there's truth to that. If right. you want to succeed in advertising, then you have to decide that you will. Right. And there's I don't no, know I'm going to try. You, you just do it. And I don't know if I ever show you, but because the graveyard is right here on my arms. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't try. <laughs> I love that quote. I love it. It's more than a quote. It's a principle for how yeah. to live your life. Look. Second question, where did you anchor first? Like mm. a boat that arrived to the harbor. What was your first place in advertising? And I, like, what other place did you explore after? I was so lucky. My very first agency was Shaite. Ah, yeah. Very we, first agency. We both from Shaite. We both pirates. Yeah. Pirates, absolutely. <laughs> and it was, it was funny because I remember I was actually, I got an internship when I was still in university. Oh, and really? What had happened is I knew nothing about the culture of advertising. I was still a student. Right. And I remember looking at the resume that I was sending to be an internship and going, this resume is bullshit. It just says I worked at a surf shop. I, I worked at a skateboard shop. I'm, uh, you know, 19 years old. But I have no experience in advertising. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. And I heard that they got 200 resumes a day, 300 resumes a day for internships. So then I, I read this book and it was called Inventing Desire. Mm -hmm. And the book was all about a reporter that lived inside Shayate for two years. And so I got to read about everyday conversations. And I noticed that they would cuss and they were passionate and, and they were creative. And so I was like, well, if my resume is not impressive, maybe the way that I deliver my res resume can show my personality. Right. So at the time it was Halloween and there was a Halloween store where you could put a naked butt on your butt, you tie it around your waist, and it looks like a naked butt. And, and I wrote my resume on the butt cheeks, and I wrote Cal Poly Senior willing to work his ass off for internship. I love that, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it in like this that. pink, don't, right? Yeah, yeah. Bad, it, but I remember I told my professor, I went up to my professor at Cal Poly, and I said, hey, I have this idea, what do you think? And he goes, oh, don't do that, don't do that. He goes, oh, you have an unusual name, they're going to remember you, and you want to work at Shia Day at least one time in your career, so don't do that. Yeah, that, that's... And I remember yeah, being... Don't well, I do was that. sad. Like, yeah, I, I love that because I feel like... I always say, you know, like, whenever someone say to you, don't do that, that's when you have to do it. That's yeah. when you want to break the rules. Like, you know, yeah. there is a lot of, like, I love punk. Uh, Me too. Movements, right? <laughs> like, well, I mean, I grew up like I'm, I was born in 1973. So, like, in the late 80s, even though I got the tail, the fading tail of like the punk movement, I kind of like, you know, I kind of grew up with the Clash and Sex Pistols. And uh, I remember the founder of the of the of the band like once say, "To be a punk is a good thing. It means like that you enter a door that you're not supposed to enter." And Hell you yeah. broke the rule that you weren't supposed to break. 
So yeah. when they call you punk, you should be, you should be happy about it. And so for yeah. me, an advice I would give like to a young creative is like, be a punk, like do something that you're not supposed to do. Like you did to enter, like to walk in chai day and yeah. you're going to get like, you know, reward for that. Yeah, I, I, totally love, I love the story, man. Oh, thanks, man. By the way, I'm wearing a Germs t-shirt. <laughs> Speaking of punk rock. <laughs> okay, look, a transatlantic journey is made of many, many nights that are terrifying. You are out there in the open water. The sky can turn into like a nightmare. Was there was ever a moment in your career in advertising when you felt like there was a nice sky coming upon you, where you felt like there was a blue moon, where you felt like it was a very hard moment to go through. Yeah, for sure. But here's the weird thing. It was self-created. It was, I was, there was a year when I was, I got into strategy. I was a strategist and there was a year, it was probably my fifth or sixth year in where I thought, I'm supposed to be a really good strategist now. So I'm supposed to have the answers. Hmm. People have, I think the worst thing people say about strategists is the oh, smartest guy in the room. Worst quote right. in the world. I don't think the best strategists have the best answers. I think the best strategists have the best questions. Hmm. And unfortunately at the time I felt this, this desire and this need to, to prove myself as a strategist. It's when I behaved the most confidently, but it was when I was the most insecure. And I think it was a time when I didn't ask for help, when I didn't brainstorm with other people, when I never said, I don't know, uh, when, I, when I didn't say, hey, we might need more, more time. I, I was the worst strategist when I thought I should have been the best. And it was a terrible, I, I wasn't enjoying it at all. I was, uh, I was failing mm -hmm. all the time because I, I, was, I brought my personal insecurity into into the job and then yeah. once i changed and understood that the, the the best creativity is associative right, right you know it's from getting being a good listener is how you become a great thinker and and understand and being empathetic and understanding how an audience must feel and, and how do i put myself in the shoes of an audience right that's when I became a better strategist. Good. But at the time when I, when I put the self-imposed pressure on myself that I alone had to have all the answers, is, that was a dark time for me. Mm -hmm. That was the worst. Talking about dark time, here's mm -hmm. the fourth question. Mm -hmm. When you embark into like, you know, to a journey across the Atlantic, you have to have a life, uh, a plan B, or you have to yeah. have what I call like a life raft. Yeah. Uh, was a time in your career where you felt like, okay, now I have to switch to plan B or now this is going to be my life raft. Have you ever mm. used a life raft in advertising? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you do need a life raft, not just in advertising, but I think in, in everything, I think uh, for me, it was when I embraced failure. Mm. When I embraced the possibility of making mistakes and opened up to being in a room and asking a good question and having even an account guy come up with what a great strategic line would be or, or a media person or whoever, it didn't matter. I was part of the team. But for me, the, the raft was failing and still being alive. I was okay. It was okay to fail. This thing that I was most afraid of, once it happened to me, then I became a better person. It's like being a boxer and never having a black eye. You're so afraid of getting a black eye. You're so afraid of breaking your nose. But once it happens, you're like, that's not that bad. I'm still here. I'm not dead. All of a sudden, the fear goes from this huge thing to this little thing, and you can keep, keep going. So for me, it was knowing that I can fail but keep going. I can fail and rely on my team. I can, and there's, n there's nothing wrong with failing as long as you keep swinging the bat. Right. So it was, it was my relationship with my agency and, and, and understanding that uh, the, the self-imposed pressure w was more extreme than the pressure my agency 
had on me and the expectations my planning director had on me. And I started having much more personal conversations, human conversations about, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried about this. Not just, I want to nail this, everything, you know, I want to make everything perfect, but being real and being human and saying, hey, I, I don't want to fail. I want to do a good job. I'm afraid I'm going to let you down. And as soon as I started talking to my planning director like that, he, it, it humanized me. And then we started having real conversations. We became good friends. I started being more open about asking for help. Uh, I made a better team of people. We all worked better together because we all felt like we were working together to come up with the answer instead of every other department waiting for this department to come up with a solution and then that department to come up with the solution. You, you, like the best creative teams is when sometimes the copywriter comes up with a visual, sometimes the art director comes up with a copy. It doesn't matter. The, the, the desire for authorship is terrible. So I embracing love, love failure. Words. And I love hearing like the power of failure. Like, you know, we always talk in America to embrace failure is very common, at least like in our universe, right? Like yeah. you constantly fail and you fail very hard. Where yeah. like in Europe, I found that the power, the power of failure is less recognized. Yeah. And people like are more afraid of failure. So look, okay. I have another question, which is one of the most important. It's life changing for you. I know because I know okay. your journey. You are one of my best friends. So mm -hmm. when you cross the Atlantic, you had to be ready to change direction, to change route, mm -hmm. to shift 360 and go mm -hmm. where you never imagined like you have gone. Now you did that. And you surprised me, and I think you surprised so many people in the advertising <laughs> world. You sure. became one of the most recognized and award-winning comedian in America. Uh, thanks, man. How I that really happened? That. Walk me through the journey <laughs> shortly. How that happened? How someone coming from <laughs> advertising goes into comedy? Walk me through the well, journey. So for me, it was an interesting journey. I was, you know, when you're an immigrant, uh, you leave a place where you have family and a safety net to a place with no safety net. We had no family. We had no, we had a very small family, just me, my mom, my dad. I think you froze again. Oh, no. Can you no. see me? Now we're good. Now we're good again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I, I think what, <laughs> the ocean. So I think what happened is when, when we first moved to America, because my parents were immigrants, we were very focused on safety. It had to be a safe job. You couldn't take risks. Like the idea of being a comedian when I was a kid, there's no way my, my, parent, my parents were, would have been, they would have become even because we don't have family here. So the idea of me taking such a high risk job was not even in, in my decision set. I couldn't think of being a comedian, but I knew that I was a funny person. And the reason why I got into advertising is because I thought, oh, this is a way we could get paid for being funny. Because I knew that funny was the most disruptive form of storytelling. So when you think about it, com I mean, comedy and advertising are actually very similar. You have word economy, where you're trying to tell a story in a very short amount of time to an audience that's not always paying attention. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So architecturally, it was very similar. Em emotionally, for me, I had to go from, even though I was very American and was in America since I was eight years old, once you closed the door to my house, it was like I was in an Egyptian consulate. It was Egypt <laughs> in the house, you know? And I really, wanted to make, I really wanted to make my dad proud. That's like the thing that you do as an Egyptian son. You really want to make your dad proud. And for me, it was like, I was always focused on how do I make my dad happy? How do I make my dad happy? And then my dad died. And when my dad died, it was the first time. It was like somebody took the GPS system out of my car. And then they said, okay, now you find your way home. Mm. And I was like, shit. Now I have to figure out, for the first time in my life, at 39 years old, I was like, what makes you happy? You know, what makes you happy? And it was Comedy made me happy, and being a funny person made me happy. But I respected comedy as a craft, just like I respected advertising as a craft. And I knew that it took me almost 10 years to feel like I was a solid strategist. 
And then, you know, and then I started really enjoying myself, you know, in advertising. So I knew it was going to take time with comedy. I used to say that being funny is like being born tall. But being good at comedy is like learning to play basketball. It's a craft. <laughs> I love you. Know, you know, like you have, you, you have an advantage if you're tall. Right. But if you don't learn how to shoot, how to pass, how to dribble, you're just going to be a tall guy that can't play. You know, I'm talking about so, this, this is the I, reason why I wanted to have you as a first guest of Transatlantic. And the reason uh, is thanks. I want young creatives and uh, everybody that works in advertising in, in Italy understand that there are no barriers. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that if you are an art director or a copywriter, you have to be an art director or a copywriter for the rest of your mm -hmm. life. Exactly. The playground, the sandbox, or whatever you want to call it, is so big, is so, uh, uh, has so much variety, it's up to us. And I think 100%. that uh, your transition, your shift from advertising to comedy, and I, 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 follow, I follow you and I, I love some of your routine, I found like hilarious, oh, <laughs> and I love the fact that you tap into like your personal experience in your relationship with your Thank father, you, and uh, I found amazing, and that's what cre creativity is at the end of the day. So, and that's I think the biggest lesson that uh, I wanted to uh, transmit to like, you know, the advertising community in Italy. Don't just play with your sandbox. Yeah. Destroy your sandbox. Build another one bigger. Yes. Look. Hundred percent. It was great talking to you, Ed. The last Thank you, brother. That I normally ask. Uh, I want to ask to every single guest that's gonna come on the show, and it's this: If there was a wind that blow your sail, and you had to name it, what would the name be? Hmm. <laughs> okay, this is going to sound really cheesy, but this is, it, it's going to be love. Love it. Love, 100%. Because here's the thing. America taught me something that was good and bad, bittersweet. It was competitiveness. Competitiveness is a good fuel when you're young. Right. It's a very good fuel. It, it makes you angry. And you're like, I want to be better. I want to be better. I want to be better. But guess what? You run out of that. You run out of that, but you don't run out of love. Love is infinite. Love is like an electric car in a, in a, on a planet that's running out of gas. You know what I mean? I love this. It's like, yeah. It's, it's, I think if you do what you love and you pursue the things that make you happy and your goal is to do good in the world and, and to do good things, you will never run out of fuel. You will never run out of fuel. And that's the way to win in this world is to be able to keep going when other people are tired. And if your fuel is love, there's going to be other people pulling over to refuel when you won't have to. You could just keep on driving. Right. So I, I think love is definitely my wind. Thank you so much. Look, come here. Like, I <laughs> know you, like, I'm now like in Europe. Uh, so if people want... Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona. And I know that if people want to enjoy your comedy stand-up routine, they can find you like, you know, in Barcelona, in Europe. And... I thank you so much for being part of Transit. Thank you, brother. It's it always was, good to catch up with you. Yeah, I'm such a big was, fan of yours. It was a hell of an experience to cross your ocean. So uh, thank, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Say hey to the family for me. I look forward to seeing you soon. We'll do. We'll do. All right, brother. Ciao, bello. Ciao.